Hello everybody, I'm Norman Mueller. I'm a Director of Product Development in Geoscience Australia. I'd like to start uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of all the lands on which we meet today and pay that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. So the seminar today is applications of Copernicus satellites to service low impact agriculture in Australia, transferring and adapting European Earth observation expertise. I won't go into great detail in rereading the entire um, blurb on that because we have with us Graciela Metternicht, the Ability Research Center of the University of Science and Policy for Sustainable Development. Prior to joining UNSW, Professor Metternicht was regional coordinator of early warning and assessment of the United Nations Environment Program. Make appointments include Head of Discipline and Professor of Geospatial Systems and Environmental Management at the School of Natural and Built Environments of the University of South Australia and Professor of Special Sciences at the Western Australia School of Mines, Curtin University of Technology. So, Graciela, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Norman, and uh, thank you to all uh, the people that are joining this morning to, to, to listen a bit of the research that we have been doing through this uh, uh, project of the, funded by the European Union. I'm talking on behalf of a large team of, uh, it's a consortium of 11 partners from Europe and Australia. So all what I'm presenting today is really not my work. I'm a kind of the voice of all these uh, uh, fantastic scientists that uh, are working uh, with me in, in delivering this project that is uh, funded by the European Union. So as you say here, um, as you say here, and, and Norman spoke, I, I, in thinking how to build the seminar, I wanted to focus on, on the topics of uh, transfer and adaptation, because this is a bit of what the European um, Commission and the European Union under this uh, call for projects put as a um, as one of the requirements that is, is about transferring technology. So the question might be, you might say, well, why the focus on agriculture? And I wanted to, to have a, bird, a bit of a bird's eye view as to why uh, it's important. And they, I will try to cover the, the, the usual questions, the, the why, the who, the what, and, and the so what to end up the presentation. The why is a bit about the issues that we are facing worldwide. We we know that uh, we have applied more fertilizers than what the land needs. So a lot of those fertilizers are being lost. In addition, Australia is a continent where we are experiencing already issues of water depletion. And some of the water risk atlases findings are that our demand for water will increase. Um, even as a, as a business as usual scenario, uh, you can see all the red parts that I illustrated here. So the question is, how can we take um, or what we need to do to, to uptake or perhaps to speak about better ways to uh, first uh, optimize in the application of fertilizers and secondly um, looking after uh, improvement of the of manage, managing water in areas of irrigated agriculture and for that we team it up with a team of uh, Spain and uh, Austria of um, Italy um, under that umbrella of the Copernicus. The Copernicus is the program of the European Union that has about 30 satellites and the idea of Copernicus is to promote the uptake of Earth's observation in different sectors from agriculture to mining to all environmental applications but also to um, under in the understanding that uh, Earth observation per se is not the solution to everything. You always will need in situ data sets. You will need to work with um, calibration and validation of your products. So that is one of the things. I, and, and our um, project try to exploit one of the satellites of the Copernicus, which is the Sentinel-2. The other aspect is that um, this one of, of not reinventing the wheel through developing new platforms 
platforms in, in projects like the one we are um, tackling here. So the, the Copernicus program has um, what they call a data and information access service called DIAS. And one of, and the call was um, for the project proposal, this specified it encourage partners to, to make use of that interface. So that say, when you identify your um, users, they, you can, whatever you develop under this interface can fit into uh, services that are already operational, as could be the case in Australia. In this case, it's, it's examples from Europe, but could be services that are operational in Australia so that there is a better connection with the end user who is supposed to benefit from all this um, technology at the end of the day. So what, uh, one of the things that you might say, well, what, what is really that you are here to adapt and transfer? And, and what we are here talking to uh, are experiences from Italy uh, that have been um, gained through prior funding of um, projects from the European uh, Commission. And these projects were looking into aspects of irrigation entitlements and, and allocation and maps that I did enable um, district authorities to check uh, whether there was compliance in irrigation entitlements and where there were there was um, non-compliance areas and also uh, mapping irrigated areas so that um, districts could uh, better allocate water and users could uh, make a, a better estimation of the water needs that they have. So these are things that um, have been developed with the help of Earth Observation and are operational these days um, in Italy. And these members are partners with us in this project that we call the, the COAL. The other is a, a story from Spain, uh, from the of, of Los Llanos. Um, and this is another team partners with us in this project that are working with farmers of this area of, uh, of Los Llanos to uh, help them to determine uh, management zone maps, variable rate fertilization, variable rate irrigation, again, all combining in situ data acquisition with earth observation. So this is the what we are to transfer. So what in, a, in a nutshell, what the project, when we proposed the project, it was about using Sentinel-2 data sets that are Geoscience Australia these days um, also uh, distributes through uh, Digital Earth Australia and is an open free access uh, satellite data sets every five days um, going around the earth, um, having the chance to acquire an, a satellite image of, of, over the same point in earth. So taking that advantage and um, trying to, the, to adapt what is already working in an operational way in Spain and Italy and tailoring that to the needs of the stakeholders uh, in Australia, which is quite a different story because we, our air, for instance, our paddocks are much larger than the ones in Europe. Um, the way we do businesses here is different from the way uh, agribusiness do run in, in, in Italy and Spain. However, there are some commonalities. The idea is that then Koala, because what, as I said to you before, the, the question was not to reinvent the wheel, uh, creating a new huge platform that um, as the project funding goes away, uh, might not be uptaking and there is no funding to maintain it. So we work under the concept, our colleagues at the University of Boko in Austria work with the concept of uh, application program interfaces. So whatever Koala conceives and develops as part of the project uh, helps to, or, or we, we work with small medium enterprise here in Australia to try to develop what we call the custom uh, application solution business case. So that whatever you develop develop in this API then can be uh, in a way incorporated into platforms of advisory services that are already operational in Australia. Um, so how we provide in a nutshell, these are, this is the suite or the set of products that we envisage to deliver after the three and a half years that the project is set, um, it has set funding. So that would be until the mid of 2023. Um, and then um, 
we work with this concept, as I said before, of cloud computing, of using the Copernicus um, Diaz infrastructure with that little bit, uh, I say, imagine a cake, that's a big cake, then a chunk of that is, is what we would call our Corala Diaz, so our uh, API user interface built within the Diaz platform. Then the idea is that we would combine uh, not only um, Earth observation, but um, data sets that come from, from airborne technology, from field data collection, and so on. We use machine learning uh, techniques for some of the products we, we are working on and, and that we began to deliver. And the idea is that you could deliver those products to some of our uh, partners. Two of our partners are businesses in Australia, as well as reaching out to uh, basin authorities, water management, or, or farmers. So the farmers could be uh, via the um, middle, via the advisory services, or uh, in the future, maybe accessing the products by themselves. Um, one of the aspects uh, that we were looking at that made a, a, that made a bit of the um, uh, that make an important aspect of our first year of the project was uh, trying to co-create with our users or trying to co-create with our users um, what just bearing in mind what they wanted um, having an idea of uh, what were the uh, stakeholder needs we conducted a stakeholder engagement processes where we conducted interviews stakeholder analysis so that the products that we envisage to develop are tailored to the needs of those users but the question is then where we wanted to do that we we selected the murray darling basin as our like the big big area within the murray darling basin uh, we we focus on four pilot areas because we have a suite of products some of them that we think are more uh, suitable for farm scale operations other might be more suitable for district level irrigations and other might be more useful for water authorities um, so we we this we identify four pilot areas to conduct our demonstrations and our initial uh, applied research, you know, to transfer and to adapt the technology. Um, this is the location of the area. Some of the, uh, them are um, dry land agricultures or there are areas under irrigation. And the idea is that we will develop at the at the third uh, final year of the project the products that could be then adopted for farm scales for um, advisory service in terms of nutrient management in terms of a better or more efficient irrigation management supported by earth observation um, also building up some of the pilot to be um, suitable or useful for district scale or so at, at the irrigation district level and um, a fourth one that we are yet to begin to work more at, uh, at the, in the northern part of the Murray Darling Basin. Some of the things that we had to confront was whether there was um, uh, where the where we had data available and uh, and the fact that we need end users to be engaged with us to tell us whether the products that we are delivering are of use or not. So one of the things that also um, this call for funding was asking for was that the, the aspect of ground data collection to validate the project. So this we have we have done it through uh, ground truthing. Uh, with airborne, with spectral radiometers, and you can see here on the screen some of the um, results from our uh, airborne campaigns over the pilot areas. So the idea is that we would have a battery of, of in situ images, um, and, and the question is, what for? Well, uh, the what for question is that all these images should help us to validate some of the algorithms that were developed in Europe and that can be adapted then to the conditions of the Australian environment. So these are some of the, the 
example, so we had a fly with uh, our partners of the University of Melbourne have installed flux towers in some of the crop uh, cropped areas that we are working with. And then with that information from the flux towers, we could um, validate some of the algorithms that were um, being used by the Italian group and the Spanish group in uh, in their um, in the algorithms that they were doing for uh, to compute in evapotranspiration and in this case on the right here on the leaf area index. So what, that was one of the aspects and I will go towards the end uh, in, in my recap a, a bit on, on the issues that uh, we did face uh, because of COVID and as you can imagine, many of these things were delayed because we could not access the fields because it was uh, it took more time um, to try to coordinate virtually uh, from from Italy to Spain to Australia and then to the farm areas where we're, we were conducting our our trials. So this is, you know, this is the why. So as you can see, we, we began with Earth's observation satellites 800 kilometers above the Earth, but in the understanding that satellites per se cannot provide the solution and therefore all our pilots had also deployed instruments for in situ measurements and for ground uh, for validation, calibration and ground truthing. So say here we, we, we said, uh, yes, uh, it's, it's a big challenge um, how much water you're going to apply. And this is one of the things that not only in Australia, but worldwide, and um, we there are this, there is this ongoing discussion of how you make um, irrigation more efficient. So in, in the case of our team uh, working uh, the University of Melbourne with our partner, the University of Naples and um, the University of Technology um, BOKU in Austria, um, they are they are combining the Sentinel-2 data sets using the thermal um, part of the, the thermal range of the spectrum, combined with some of the agrometeorological data that we have um, uh, we have uh, acquired from in situ and also from the Australian Bureau of Meteorology, and combining that with some of the algorithms that have already been applied. And in the case of our team from Italy, they have um, adapted some of these um, uh, algorithms for uh, uh, for to derive the information from Sentinel-2 images. So here are some examples of the products that we produce and we have a demo that um, if any of you is interested at the end of the talk, uh, I will put my email address and you can contact me to get access to this demo. The idea is that uh, the demo uh, let you uh, see all the different layers that are generated through the project, uh, through the by the different team members of the project, and that those layers can be switched on and off over a farm, over a district, to have the understanding not only of the change at a point in time, but of the trends. So in this case, um, there is um, a, poten a, a daily product of uh, evapotranspiration potential and that daily product can be derived over a year and then you can determine the trends. Um, so the other thing that uh, the team is doing is looking into for trying to forecast crop evapotranspiration and um, I'm not an expert in the area but this is uh, this is what what they say, how they are doing. So they have adapted one of the FAO equations to remote sensing and trying to uh, produce through um, through their computation uh, the crop evapotranspiration in a forecast mode. They um, the trials they are doing is to try to have a, a, a forecast of up to six days uh, in terms of uh, calculating or forecasting rainfall and forecasting evapotranspiration. So these are all experiments that they are running at present. So the other thing is that we tried also we that we got uh, through our users is the the idea of trying to make uh, irrigation crop water requirement maps um, and this is something that again we are working because um, it has you know they say the requirements from pixel to district scale 
day by day with a forecast of up to 10 days. So this is the, the target to be able to deliver that um, so that they, we can estimate, we can provide a tool that might be useful to estimate the water requirements in space and uh, over space and in time. Um, another area that we are beginning to work is trying to, to see how the products that we, uh, that uh, the project is developing uh, could help to uh, better, uh, for better water accounting. And these are two of the steps that um, the team has been um, thinking would be useful uh, for, for uh, as, as a go ahead. So irrigate, mapping the irrigating areas and then estimating of the irrigation crop water requirements for the area. So if we have an idea of the crops that are, pro, uh, uh, that are part of a district or uh, that a water authority is, is trying to do the water accounting, then how, how much volume. So it could be a kind of quality control or a second estimate of, um, of what, for the water accounting. And then um, our final product is mapping of uh, irrigated areas uh, with the help of the data sets that are acquired by the Sentinel data sets and combine uh, with the, that, with the uh, machine learning algorithms and fed or uh, those machine learning algorithms um, being, um, being used in the input from the ground truthing data that I showed you before, that we, our colleagues from the University of Melbourne were doing the, the field campaigns uh, of crop types uh, in addition to all the soil moisture and other information that we collected. So one of the aspects I, uh, that uh, we learned, uh, and, and now it's more of a kind of reflection, is how through this time um, we, we had to balance this engagement with users and, and trying to understand um, what the user actually want and understanding also the challenges as to whether what the, what the wants are can be delivered. And for that, we did in, in our stakeholders interview, uh, we, we did um, a series of, of questions and then we built up some of um, clusters of what were the main aspects that they wanted to see in any platform that is based on this type of technology. Um, and sometimes, well, what came out is that they, they want uh, critical information at the right time. And often that, uh, that is real time. Sometimes Earth observation can do that. However, there are limitations for, for that as well. Uh, they want uh, products that can be easy to use, preferable that you can get into smartphone or that a smartphone or a tablet. Um, that you can also integrate information and data sets from all the resources, and that there's that you know that you have that seamless integration with existing user uh, tools or platforms. Because when we were conducting um, the survey, many many of uh, we we identified a couple of issues around water management uh, that are these ones on the left on availability, the losses of the system, the need to increase water efficiency. Uh, we identify challenges around nutrient management, so the, the, the loss via runoff, the variable rate application. We also identify the information needs. So can I know uh, a bit more about the irrigation schedule and the yield forecast, rainfall forecast, difficult to, to deliver perhaps for us, um, nutrient use efficiency, uh, nitrogen use efficiency, and the information so sources, so how people want uh, to see the data be delivered to them, in what format, with what frequency. Uh, to whom local agronomists and service providers, for instance. So issues that we face, and, and this is not new because uh, I, I have been reading uh, other recent works and, uh, on uptake of technology, and, and it's new. Many of you might sit through this presentation and say, well, what are you offering that all, others already are not offering? And this is true. Many farmers did complain about the information deluge. Um, the risk of stranded assets, the, the, the need that the data is not provided and show it to you in a map, but that that map helps you or help, or that map tells you a story on how you can make better decisions. Issues around privacy. Then we had um, issues around the trust in satellite images. Uh, over the past, there have been many um, 
many startups or many uh, trials where sometimes um, the power of satellite images might have been oversold or might, might have not been explained properly. So that you build that expectation on your end user. And then when that is not delivered, um, you shoot a window. And sometimes uh, then it's very difficult to uh, to conquer again that trust, that to get that engagement and conquer the trust on, on the product that you're trying to deliver. Um, and how to interpret new information. So all the maps that I show, so the, far, the, the, the end users ask uh, how that can help me to make a better decision. And I put here some of the, the excerpts that we have from from the farmers and from irrigators that we were interviewing so um, how you make how they make decisions uh what is that worry them um uh, what is the issues around cost how much they are prepared to to, to pay for products or for new innovation so one of our, um, I got here some quotes of one of our alpha users. So when we began the project, we identified for the uh, dry line uh, irrigation agriculture, where we have been trying more of the um, nutrient management products. Um, we call them alpha users. And then they have been trial, they, uh, they have been validating and also assessing and giving us critical feedback on the usefulness of some of the products. So this is a comment from one of them, Tim. Um, and this is what he, he said, that's he, that is what he would like to do. So tracking the year compared to other years. So we have here, for instance, and we did develop um, uh, these curves that would show uh, team, how how things were tracking a year ago, how things are, are tracking this year, and um, and then uh, overline that information to um, levels of low, moderate, or high water stress uh, for him to to be able to track how this year compares to the previous ones. So. For us, um, it has been uh, uh, the, the challenge has been to try to constantly engage with our end users to get the feedback and to keep improving on on the on the equations on the products that we deliver and the usefulness. This is another one where we have developed simple things as the NDVI that is very common here in Australia. And Tim said, "Well, um, I like this table of the average NDVIs." that for each wheat and barley paddocks, that gives me a clear idea of the paddocks that are progressing better or worse than their peers and help me to manage my expectations and input plans for the rest of the season. So again, here is, is the product as, a, as an input to the as decision support system, but we work with uh, rather than saying, well, this is what you have here, just trying to understand from the end user perspective what what this product can be useful for for them um bcg is one of our um partners uh in terms of um, um advisory services that they provide um they were conducting some um some some feedbacks with the farmers and they the feedback they got so far is that the nutrient um, nitrogen index maps that um, our colleagues are producing um, are the ones that show more promise or more interest from the farmers so this is an area where we are conducting now more field validations um, and then some you know some really honest feedback that they say well the three alpha users that we have um, they like uh, the zone management maps that uh, the project did provide for them. Um, they look forward to use them, but um, they they still think that there are opportunities to to improve these management zone maps. And um, perhaps for some areas, they say with the alpha users have paddocks where they don't think the current zones are perfect, but Koala might have an opportunity here although the potential um, uh, potentially the, the, uh, a smaller market. So this is something that we, again, a uh, useful feedback that we collect in addition to uh, working with the alpha users, but from the enterprises or the, the clients that are that are delivering advisory services and that ultimate might be one of the might be the adopters of some of the layers that the, the project will deliver the API. So the learning so far 
conscious of time. Um, the complexity of the consortium. Uh, we began all happy um, here in 2000, uh, early 2020, the only face-to-face -face meeting that we had amongst the 11 consortium partners before uh, COVID hit. Uh, we we kept operating, but it has been all virtual, so we had to overcome the the complexity uh, working from different two different continents, um, different ways of working, different ways perhaps of of dealing with uh, stakeholders um, and and different stakeholder markets. Um, so the collaboration and the cooperation in this new year of COVID has been quite um, quite challenging in some aspects, but we learn a lot about then uh, how we can improve uh, the work in a virtual in a virtual manner and still deliver. Uh, other things that we learned is the importance of you know the translational research. How um, how also we could all we could trial the products here, but how we can best engage uh, with uh, end users to to understand what the needs are, what the wants are, and then to what extent those needs and wants can be fulfilled. Um, the communication and dissemination through the project, we have been in contact with some um, uh, curriculum developers for agricultural schools. And one of the things we, we did not think uh, very strongly at the beginning of the project was how we could main, make some of the products that we were building through research suitable for uh, teaching in high schools, uh, teaching about new technologies. Um, and that was an unexpected benefit that we we, we got from, from engage, engaging with curriculum developers that they saw a potential in these uh, products. And so since then we have developed demos that school can use to understand how satellites can be used to help agriculture. Um, and also we learned that earth science, well, within earth science is, is very competitive. And, uh, and one of the things that you constantly need to uh, remind or find or explain is what is your competitive advantage? What, what is the, the purpose of your product and how your product is, uh, what is the, the comparative advantages that you have? Um, so you might say, well, the so what? Uh, all the learnings we we hope we, we still have one and a half years to go but um we in that we recently saw and i recently read some of the uh, papers articles like this one the australian agriculture sets the sites on space um there are others from very high resolution uh, satellite uh, companies that are trying to um, promote the use on agriculture. So AgriFutures uh, Australia did commission a report early this year and the findings of that uh, on the uptake and the findings of this report are briefly described in this um, nice article here. But I rescued this um, excerpt that I thought summarizes in a way some of the things that we experienced in, in beginning with this project and one of some of the reasons why we are focusing on this project. And, and it says that we have a lot of satellite enabled, so enabled solutions that have been developed uh, to the Australian rural industries. But uh, the report of AgriFutures conclude that the wide scale adoption still remains low. And one of and they describe a series of barriers that I can identify with some of the barriers of the uptake around engagement, around building trust, around building um, the chain between your your developer and your user, and that constant feedback loop of uh, of things that work and those that don't work. And they say, well, there is a need to improve connectivity to make demonstrations more accessible. Clarify the value proposition. That's a, an, an ongoing issue for us. So what is our value proposition? And simplify the way, the way people can access data, which is one of the things that this Horizon 2020 program um, that falls under the umbrella of the European Commission and, 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 the, and the funding, the Copernicus program, uh, tries to do so that uh, you don't reinvent the wheel through these API uh, platforms, the ideas, the ideas that then you you develop things that you connect on things that are already 
being accessed by people and that things are simpler to, to implement. So in a way, um, I hope you enjoyed the, the talk. I thank you very much for your attention on behalf of the of all the team here, uh, University of Melbourne, University of Sydney, uh, University of Naples, POCO, um, BCG Group, um, and, and the teams of uh, Italy and Spain, uh, the different uh, small medium enterprises that are helping us with the project. Um, this is the website for the project, um, koala, uh, koalaproject.eu, uh, where you can access more information about, about what we do and our progress and thank you very much and I'm open to questions uh, if I can answer them or just to address, to direct you to uh, some of the, the colleagues of mine that might be experts uh, if the question is too technology oriented. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Graciela. Um, I must just quickly apologize that my internet is poor. I'm connecting via satellite internet and it's raining, which means that things get a bit patchy. So if you can't hear me for a second, I do apologize. I will try to be as clear as possible. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat, um, starting with Robert Hewson. Um, does your study area in the Murray-Darling Basin include the Pyramid Hill salinity study areas? Are the study areas one to three boundaries available to access as shapefile? No, Robert, it does not include that area of Pyramid Hill from what I recall. Um, uh, yeah, no. Um, yes, the study areas, shapefiles, uh, yeah, I could talk to the team and, and uh, ask if they could be made available um, through um, to you, yes. But not not the not the area that you mentioned. Um, yep. Okay. Thanks, Graciela. Um, another question: How close are we to real time data? What is the smallest block resolution derived from the satellite image? This is from Edward Zwick. Um, Edward. Uh, I hope that I that yeah, Edward. <laughs> Edward, the the. The satellite, the Sentinel images are um, have bands at uh, a special resolution that varies between a 10 and 20 meters. So it's a 10 meters resolution through the through the interpolation. Uh, how close are we to to real time data? Um, the way our colleagues process the data set, I know that um, 24 hours after the satellite pass, they can have the, the data corrected into the DIAS platform. Um, but that's the raw data. And and how how quick they, um, I'm not sure how quick they are uh, to transform that into some of the products that we spoke. Uh, however, I think that um, what they are trying to do with the forecasting is to, as I, as I said, is to have a forecasting of up to 10 days ahead, at least for for water. Um, so satellite passes every five days. If there are not cloud cover, um, you can access an image every five or six days of the area. The processing time is what has been uh, optimized. So now you can get it um, almost, yeah, that's the closest to near real time. But uh, we still are, um, yeah, we still are uh, a bit away from from the real time. In in as much you know, in as much as the satellite cycle does not repeat, uh, it does not have a closer um, temporal resolution or a larger temporal resolution. Let's say daily or every three days, as other satellites might do. But Sentinel is once every five days. I'm not sure if that um, responded to the question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Pascal, I do continue with the other, Norman. Yes, um, let's move on to Pascal Katsalazzi. Um Are the applications principally focused on Sentinel-2? Are there Sentinel-1 applications planned? 
No, so far it's all um, it's all with Sentinel two. That's the idea uh, for the three years project. But um, I think there are there is also uh, potential on Sentinel one. However, this is not what this project will be doing. Okay, thank you, Graciela. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. Graciela, did you want to just perhaps um, talk briefly about where the Copernicus program itself is going in relation to this sort of Earth observation monitoring and management? There are many um, satellites in that group, uh, just while we wait for some more questions to arrive. It does look like there's a couple more now. Um. Copernicus, uh, they are expanding many of the areas to to try to to try to cover more 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 and more applications. Um, I I think for agriculture they they understood the need for um, for the market, and in the areas that I presented before, there is a lot of research not only in, in Australia but overseas. As we got funded for this project, there were other projects about technology transfer. Um, to in terms of water efficiency and, um, um, and water management, that also is underpinned by the Sentinel data set. So, Copernicus will continue. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not familiar with the latest um, changes for the call for the Horizon 2020 program, um, but uh, for us it was uh, uh, if I can make a detour on 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 this uh, horizon 2020 for us was a, a bit of a, a great what's a great opportunity because usually those funds go for european only and this time is one of the first times that um australian research uh in uh, organizations and and small medium enterprise can be partners in a project and receive funding and and look for uh for the to deploy work here that can lead them to this technology transfer. Um, that said, uh, I think for there are many other opportunities for accessing and using data from the Copernicus. They are trying to promote the DS platform. They, as I said before, they are trying to promote that uh, the fact that you use um, the the DS platform as a as a as an interface and and that you don't recreate constantly new new platforms and that you rather embed on what users are doing Norman. Thank you. So uh, another couple of questions. First we have David Collins. Have any phone apps been developed for farmers yet? Yes, in, in Spain, uh, they have developed for, uh, um, uh, apps for farmers. And the idea is that uh, when we, as we work through the final year of the project, that we can develop some, um, some apps so that the products can be delivered through smartphones. However, um, David, that final, you know, that final part is because we want that the products are developed uh, or are adopted by the, by say the likes of the advisory services providers. We need to work with them, looking into the way they are delivering their products at present, and then try to adapt that technology that they are already using to embed our products in that one. But in Spain and in Italy, the, the, you know, when I was saying what is to be transferred, what is to be adapted, this is the thing. This this is one of the ways in which they deliver their products. Thank you. And another question from Shukrat Shokirov: Are there any papers that the group published to demonstrate the results? Yes, Shukrat, I took the slide out not to make the things too long. Um, some of the um, some of the algorithms that were applied and developed in in Europe have been published, so I can send you a copy of those papers. Um, we still didn't write up the pa papers from their validation and calibration that has has been conducted so far in Australia. That's not published yet, but uh, I can facilitate access to those uh, published papers from Europe. 
Okay, thank you, Graciela. Um, are there any other questions? We don't have anything else in the chat at the moment. Still have a little bit of time up our sleeve. Well, I, I would, um, I would like to use then if there is a bit of extra time. I would like to use the time to invite people to uh, visit our website and to connect with us if any of the listeners today are interested in trialing the products uh, because one of the one of the things that we we like to do is engage in um, in trying you know in trying to get this adoption and uptake so if any of the uh, listeners today would be interested to get in touch with us via our web website or, or just contacting me um, because um, it's essential for us to to understand um, where things can be improved. So we are at present working with VCG. We will begin uh, working shortly with IREC in the areas of irrigation management, uh, but there are still plenty of room for um, for other um, what we call alpha users that can give us feedback on the products and, and, and that's always something that we we are open to to collaboration. Thank you Norman sir, for the opportunity to do this uh, this public talk. Um, it's always good to to promote what what we are trying to do and certainly not in an easy space because as as you said to me many times it's a crowded space the one on on earth observation and agriculture um and you need to to work uh developing uh trust and that trust for us has been uh, one aspect uh, through engaging with uh, people as we as much as we could during COVID, but also in ensuring that we have good protocols for calibration and validation of, of the products that we are transferring and adapting to the Australian environment. Um, so even in that regard, uh, it would be nice to hear from others that have been trying to do the same uh, in terms of barriers for the uptake of the technology. I did not mention um, that one of the areas, Norman, that we also were looking at is um, about the wa the water policies of Australia. So, in uh, the the idea is to mm -hmm. identify to what extent the current water policy at Commonwealth and state levels might be enablers or barriers for the uptake of earth observation based technology. So, this is something we we are looking at. We did an initial desktop review, and we will conduct um, a further uh, study. Because because um, having a set of identify a state, a set of enabling uh, conditions or the enabling environment from a policy perspective for the uptake of Earth observation technology in this sector um, is very important. So we want to understand where, if any, where there are the barriers. Okay. Well, thank you, Graciela. I think it might be worth calling the seminar to a close now. Thank, Thank you. you to everybody who um, engaged with us in chat. Um, we hope that this session was informative and we also hope that you join us next time. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you very much.